I should say Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Easter, <laughs> welcome to summer, because it's been a very long time since my last real podcast. Um, and that's just because life has been busy. So today I thought I would catch you up on what I'm doing. It is mid-July already of 2018, and um, a great deal of things have happened since um, the last podcast. So I think I'll just go ahead and get started with some finished objects, and I'll fill you in on life as, as I go along. So... I believe last time I was talking to you, I was working on these socks. They are now a complete pair, both finished. These, I believe I call them the summer wave socks because when I bought the yarn, the blues and greens kind of remind me of sea glass and the seashore, and it may even be the name of the colorway, I can't remember. Um, but it's Barocco Comfort Sock. I've shown them on the podcast before, but now it is a complete pair. And I was able to knit quite a long leg on these because the yarn was so generous um, in terms of the skein. The, the entire sock is done with cuffs, heels, and toes. So out of the skein, I got two large-footed woman socks. I have very, very long feet. Um, I wear size 10, so I have two socks um, and still a great big hunk of yarn left over. So that's a lot of yarn coming out of that one um, ball. Beautiful, love them. They're very light um, in feel. They don't feel super heavy, um, which is kind of nice. And so I think they'll be a great early fall uh, sock. And they have been on my feet, but just for keeping my feet warm. I haven't actually worn them in shoes or anything, but usually as I knit, usually as I knit the second one, I use the first one to keep a foot warm. They are not identically matchy-matchy, so that may be where the extra yarn comes in so that you can make them identical matchy-matchy. Um, doesn't bother me that they don't match in this particular instance because it was sort of... Um, um, a randomly, it, it, it just doesn't bother me. It's clear that they are matching socks and nobody, I usually wear my, my wool socks with clogs and long pants, so very little of the sock is actually seen. Um, this is just for me. Uh, I did these top down, which is a little unusual for me. I was in a top down phase for a little while. Uh, I have partridge heel and otherwise it's just a pretty typical um, vanilla kind of sock. I believe I even used the vanilla, a vanilla sock pattern, and that would all be linked on my Ravelry page. So I have a pair of finished socks in 2018, for which I'm very excited. Second, when you last saw me, I was working on my husband's birthday sweater. Now this would be my husband's birthday sweater a year ago last March when I started it. Knew I wasn't going to get it finished for that birthday, but I wanted to make sure I got it done before this birthday, and I think I just about finished it in time and he has been wearing it since. This is a Longfellow cardigan which is a Brooklyn tweed pattern uh, by Michelle Wang and I did knit it out of Brooklyn tweed loft yarn and um, this is all I had left at the end <laughs> so I was very Glad that I didn't have a lot of yarn left over. Um, I really love the drape of the cardigan made out of the yarn once it's been washed and blocked. And I think my husband likes it. It's um, lightweight, but not too light. Uh, the yarn really blooms nicely um, and evens out when it's blocked. I don't know if you can see it. It's very dark. I believe the color is called Almanac, and it's a blue with some little flecks of like brighter turquoise and white and, and um, kind of looks like denim blue jeans to me. It has these nice leather buttons um, on them and it's just a very classic plain but fitted, not, um, not horribly fitted, but my husband is 
slim and um, a lot of times to make a sweater it's just a whole lot of breezy bulk in the bottom so this is fitted somewhat and he really likes that with some pockets now the one thing that's not on here that he wants are leather elbow patches so I have these suede elbow patches that actually I believe I found in my grandmother's stuff which match the buttons and it's just waiting for him to try it on and me to have the time and the patience to figure out the right placement for them. These are pre, uh, the holes are pre-punched. Um, I will have to find some, I don't know, strong, uh, strong cotton thread to actually stitch them on um, so that they will stay because the yarn itself is too thick to go through those holes. In addition, one thing about loft yarn is it, it tears pretty easily. Um, you can just grab it and rip it if you're not careful. So when you're sewing up seams, I did sew the seams with loft, but you have to be careful. It's not one of those things where you can just tug because then, boom, you have um, torn your yarn in the middle of sewing a seam. But he likes it, it fits well, it's the second lo um, Longfellow cardigan that I sewed for him, that I've knitted for him. And he will wear it quite a bit, especially this fall now that it's completed. And one of my goals in the next week or so is to get the actual patches on the sweater and make sure that's what he still wants. So that's my second finished object. Then I worked most of the spring. So that, that sweater was done early March. And then I cast on for a super special, super secret knit that um, will have to wait to be unveiled. And that took a long time. It was not the kind of knitting I could do at a ball game. Uh, it required too much concentration and um, the yarn was felt very delicate, so I couldn't just, you know, schlep it around everywhere. So stay tuned for that. Some of you know what it is already. And um, anyway, it won't be long and I'll be able to show you that. I also worked, um, so I have three sons and I'm a full-time math teacher. So spring is very busy. So working on that at night depended on me having my schoolwork out of the way and not having a baseball game to go to, etc. So it did take a long time to um, get that project done. And yet I still needed something for all the baseball games. So my youngest son um, plays baseball in high school. And so I did work on a project, which is in the car because it's considered car knitting and I forgot to go get it. But I did work on my leaf lace pocket cardigan, I think is the name of the sweater. The leaf lace pocket cardigan. It is um, lace leaf, sorry. Lace leaf pocket cardigan. And you can see that it has a pocket with the leaves on it. It's a, um, knit in the round from the bottom up. And I have split for the sleeves already. I, the amount I've accomplished is I've done all the bottom. I have a split for the sleeves and um, then you knit the back all the way up and that's done. So I need to go back and knit the fronts and then knit the sleeves, I believe is what's left to do. And it, this is being made out of Rowan wool cotton. And I will have to bring, remember to get that out of the car next time. Um, to show you. But the nice thing about it being knit in the round, it has um, it has this edging already built in so there's no need to do um, any sort of button band afterwards and the bottom's done. Um, the pocket still needs to be stitched so the spot for the pocket has been made but I'll need to make the pockets. And um, most of the time it's just knitting, stocking it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth remembering the edging. And that's pretty mindless knitting. Um, it was knitting I was able to do um, in the car on long trips and at a lot of baseball games. So 
Again, it was made out of rowan wool cotton. It's in this kind of leafy green. I was hoping to get it finished, um, but working on that at the games and then working on the other project at home, which was my uh, priority, plus getting the husband's birthday sweater finished within a year of his birthday, <laughs> was all pretty important. So this is close to being finished, but of course, it's in my car. Haven't brought it in. And immediately when school was out, I got cast on itis. And I have cast on a lot of things. <laughs> so this is sort of on the back burner, but I'm hoping to get it done by fall because I think it's going to be a nice lightweight um, cardigan. It isn't a springy color, but I bet I could wear it a little bit in the fall in those first early cool days. I, I don't really care too much about I don't pay too much attention to whether the color is appropriate for the season, let's put it that way. So that's not a finished object, but that was something I was working on this spring as well. Um, the last finished object I'm going to show you is a set of coasters. So end of school year came and I um, received several very generous, very lovely gifts from students. Um, but two students in particular, one gave me a, a gift certificate to my local yarn shop, which is like, ooh, that's very exciting. And then another student, and they, they all know that that's what I do in my spare time is that I love to knit, gave me um, some wool roving and some needle felting. It was basically a needle felting kit and thought she might, I might enjoy exploring needle felting. And I did, I enjoyed it very much. I uh, My boys all went to the Waldorf school in town and the Waldorf school has an emphasis on handwork. And one of the things they do at some point is needle felting or um, wet felting um, with roving. And I had actually been to one of the, a parent workshop at the school where they taught us the basics of needle felting and that was fun. I am not particularly adept because I've had no practice except that one experience at making actual patterns or designs. Um, I was very impressed at Rhinebeck this year. There was a person who uh, had a booth of needle felted birds and bird houses and toadstools and all of the, these incredible 3D beautiful objects. And I was so impressed. That is not my strength. But this was, was just fun because it was just a set of, um, I purchased a set of wool felt coasters to do the needle felting on because we always need coasters around our house. And then I took the roving, which was a mixture of blue and this uh, yellow and pink and then this more purple and pink. So there were like three little sets of roving and then the needles and I just played. I didn't try to make them all matchy matchy um, I just taught myself um, and played. It came with a little styrofoam block to do the, to um, pound the needles into. And it was very freeing just to play and grab a, a tuft of yarn, whatever I felt like um, putting in next. And it's probably like great stress relief actually. And so you could see I was kind of going for a swirly pattern. I was feeling in a very circular mood with these three and then I thought you know what let's just let's just play and so I did so I have four coasters it was a lovely gift I enjoyed it very much and I need to um, take pictures and send a thank you note um, to the student for this because it really you know it's like being a little bit of a child again just with my needles and taking out some end of year frustrations and now I have these lovely objects to sit on my um, table. So that's what I've accomplished this spring and um, not too bad with how busy the spring is um, with my children or mainly my, my youngest child at this point. So then school's out. Um, this summer, my middle son is doing an internship in this in South Carolina, so he's not even home this summer. And my oldest son, 
will be a senior next year in high school. It's like, oh my goodness, cannot believe that. And he has the ability this summer to drive himself. Last summer, he had his permit, but he wasn't driving on his own yet. So it was still mom, drive him to baseball practice, mom, take him to uh, work, pick him up from work, whatever he wanted to do. Mom was the taxi driver. This summer, he drives. He found himself a job at a local farm. He has a vet shadow um, gig going on one day a week. He has a vet camp. He has baseball practice. So basically, my days are suddenly child-free and not even needing to transport him anywhere. And it's very odd. And it's a little bit lonely, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but it's also kind of liberating. But I've, I've really struggled to get into a rhythm. And part of that is because my oldest son is getting married this summer. In fact, we are about two weeks away from the wedding. And he's getting married at home here at our house. We have a large bit of land and we have a lovely pond where they got engaged. And so they want to have the wedding down at the pond. And then up in the front field, they're going to have the reception. And so that has meant lots and lots of yard work and cleaning up and pruning things and weeding and weeding and weeding and weeding. And then at the beginning of the summer, we had a ton of rain. So the yard need to be mowed like twice a week just to keep up with it. And we needed, and it's a lot of yard to keep up with. So I have been doing a lot of that. We've repainted some stuff on the house. Um, we had a well house on an old well that was falling apart that we decided to clean up because it's right where the reception is and rebuild. So there have been a lot of those projects and, you know, you, you weed all morning, you come in and you're filthy and you just, ugh, you feel spent for the day because it's also been quite warm. There's still a lot to do before um, the end of the month when the wedding happens. So exploring different options, um, figuring out how we're going to do things, planning for the rehearsal dinner, all that has taken a lot of time. And because that's sort of extraordinary stuff, it's not everyday, typical everyday kind of things, it's made it hard for me to get into a pattern of, of my day, which, ah, which has made it a little bit of an odd summer all over. I mean, it's just, it's odd not having any children at home that I have to really get places, even though that has really been tapering off. I, duh, I mean, I don't know why I wasn't expecting it, but in any case, Summer hit, I put the school books on the floor in my bedroom, which have been pulled out because I do need to be doing some preparation for next year. And I'm a little bit behind on that. Because, you know, there's this wedding. And then there are all these things I wanted to knit. So, let me show you what I cast on um, once school is out. So, this is my um, sock knitting bag. And languishing at the bottom of my sock knitting bag was this stripy sock, which I talked about in other podcasts. I made a pair of socks like this for the Hubbler. Um, this is a um, uh, one of those Zauber balls that um, changes color along the way. And I made him a pair of socks using gray. Um, this is Coop Knits sock yarn and then the crazy zauber ball uh, striping alternate stripes and I had enough of the yarn left over that I was going to make myself a pair so I've knit myself the first sock and I should have immediately cast on the second sock so that I could be done with a pair of socks right I made myself do the second sock and finish the second sock but when it came to doing this second sock I was like no I have been holding back on casting on for too long and so this sock is sitting at the bottom of the bag. Instead, what I did was I pulled out my sock yarn and I said, okay, I'm gonna cast on one sock out of the remaining sock yarn only. I ended up not being able to make up my mind and I cast on two. So the first sock I'm gonna show you is, at this point, a half finished object and a fairly well started second sock. This yarn is um, by Into the World, 
Um, it's the Mariadoc colorway. It's a four ply 7525 superwash merino nylon. And it reminds me of a dessert I used to make a long, long time ago. We have blueberry and blackberry and we used to have raspberry bushes um, here on our property. And at some point in the summer when everything was ripe, I would make tapioca pudding, which is sort of creamy, and I'd make a berry sauce, and um, often I would make the sauce and then strain it to get all the pips out because my husband has Crohn's disease and it's just easier if he didn't have all the pips in it. And then whipped cream, which is white. And you'd put those three things together and it would make this lovely, this just reminds me of it. There's a creamy background with all these different shades of purple, purple, very, very dark, almost black purple, to a pale rose pink, and little shades of gray in between, and that's just kind of what this dessert looked like. So I call these socks, um, berries, these are my berries and cream socks. Um, where did the finished one go? Here it is. And I put, uh, I decided to try Afterthought heels. Now I'd done an Afterthought heel before on a tiny child sock. A um, long time ago, and so I knew the basic idea of the afterthought heel, but I wanted to try out getting the placement of the afterthought heel correct and how the fit of it felt because I have another set of socks I'm going to show you in a minute that it was really important to me um, that the afterthought heel worked right because it's a self striping yarn. So this I was just my first attempt at um, an afterthought heel on my own feet. So. This um, is from a mini, and I have it, Whoop. where did it go? Here's the mini, and I've just lost the tag for it. It's um, Coriodel Wool and Nylon, simple sock fingering called Majesty's Fruit. And it was just a little mini that I picked up at my local yarn shop that I used for another pair of socks I did for my son for Christmas. And it just, it matched perfectly. So I did the heel out of that, tried it on, loved the fit, loved how it worked out. And so I'm now on the second sock. I'm just about at the point where I need to place the waist yarn. And that's the method I prefer to do. I prefer to do the waist yarn. I think it just makes it easier to pick up the stitches um, and it's not hard to remove the waste yarn. Um, yeah, so that's that's where I am with these socks. And I'm super excited to finally be getting to use this yarn, which I purchased at Rhinebeck. This is one of my Rhinebeck purchases from October a year ago, so I'm not going to be languishing too long um, after that. So those are one pair of socks. I am knitting these toe up. Um, I do um, Judy's Magic, Magic Cast On, knit toe up. I am using the pattern from the Vanilla Latte Socks by Virginia Rose, Virginia Rose Jeans or Rose Jean, I don't know. Um, but it, I will link, all of the links that I have will be with the show notes, which is on my website. Mama Flock Knits, and I'll put all that information down below or at the beginning so you can look it up. And it's also on my Ravelry page. Um, so I'm using that pattern here. And then the Afterthought Heel, um, I will also link that, the one that I chose for that. Um, I'm using Carbons, Double Pointed Needles. Um, and what else do you need to know about these socks? Oh, so um, I'm so excited. I want to get these done because A, I should probably get back to this sock and get these done. And I want to get my other pair of socks done. And I have like three or four balls of sock yarn just screaming at me to get them on the needles. So in my haste, like I said, I was using the vanilla latte sock pattern. And it's basically sort of a rib here. Here's the front of the sock. It's basically sort of a rib here. And every other row, you're supposed to knit all the way around, and then every other row you do the pattern. This sock 
I forgot about the skipping doing you know I did the pattern every row now because it's a rib I don't think anybody will ever know um, the only way you can tell is if you've got this on your foot and it's stretched far apart you'll see that the purl stitches have a set of knit stitches in between whereas in this one it's just purl all the way down so here's my dilemma do I now that I've realized that and I realized it just like yesterday I'm not gonna rip this whole sock out and fix that um, but I could start doing the pattern now the only part that people tend to see when you're wearing the socks are the so part that are out of out of the shoe which would be up here and I haven't done that part yet so then they'd be matchy matchy but on the other hand you're not with all that's going on you're really not gonna see it so I don't know why I cared that I goofed up on the sock nobody's ever gonna notice but I suspect I will I will go back to the regular regularly scheduled pattern that was supposed to be there okay so that's it for this sock now one thing I did remember to do is once I got the heel in um, or once I got past where the heel was going to go I remember to start doing the pattern all the way around the sock and that's important because I did not remember to do that on this next pair of socks again doesn't matter probably not so, um, I have I have plenty of yarn. I really don't need to be buying yarn until I knit down some of the yarn that I have. Um, so I've been trying to be very good. But on Instagram one day, I saw this yarn knit up by an independent dyer, and I just it just sang to me. So, and I may have talked about this before when I purchased the yarn. I may have mentioned it. I don't know. Maybe not. I'm sure I mentioned it on Instagram plenty, but. Right now, I'm loving this yellow-gray combination. And so I saw this yarn, and more importantly, I saw it knit up. And that's one of the things I really love. When, when yarn dyers can give us a sample of what it looks like knitting knitted up, I'm often a little more adventurous than when it's just, yes, it's pretty in the hank, but what's it going to look like when it's all together? So this is the Ello Grello colorway by Dye For You. Um, an independent yarn dyer and I believe in Canada I'm pretty sure for in Canada and I will have her um, information all linked in the show notes or you can see it there it is 80% um, superwash 20% nylon fingering weight yarn and I'm loving knitting it up because it makes these beautiful beautiful stripes beautiful beautiful stripes and this is how I saw it originally how um, the yarn dyer um, had knitted up as the stripes and then she posted or reposted a picture of somebody who had chosen to do a texture pattern with the stripes and that also looked fantastic so I decided that that's what I would do so these are the socks this is the first sock minus the heel um, and I decided I wanted to split the stripe and do a solid color heel I think that's the plan and the plan is hopefully to have enough of this yarn left over to do a gray heel there but I probably ought to knit the sock first right but that's the beauty of the afterthought heel I can still play with this gorgeous yarn um, Again, toe up. Um, I always use um, Judy's Magic Cast On. And then this is the, the pattern from the Hermione Everyday Sock, um, which is a free pattern on Ravelry by Erica Luter. Luter? 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 Um, again, the links will be in the show notes. And I think it's just, you know, I'm not a photographer or a videographer, but I think it really, really looks fun. And I really love these socks. I really do. I'm having so much fun. I always do the surprisingly stretchy cast off, bind off. Um, and so this one is done. But what I didn't do once I left the heel spot is I didn't do the carry the pattern up the back. 
And at first I was like, oh, darn. And then I thought, no, you know, this way I get the best of both worlds. In the front, I got the pretty pattern. In the back, I've got the pretty stripes. Does it matter? Is anybody going to notice? Maybe a sock knitter would go, oh, why, why, why didn't she carry it up the back? But on the other hand, maybe that's just, that's just the way it, it is. So I am knitting this one using my carbons, um, but doing magic loop because my other carbons are obviously on that sock. <laughs> and I don't have a ton of, uh, I love magic loop and I love DPN, so it doesn't matter to me um, either way. And I'm so happy. Um, and for this one, see if I can do this. They're gonna be matchy matchy. This one has been on my foot a lot, so the toe isn't quite so pointed because, you know, like I said, I often wear one sock while I'm knitting on the other. But the stripes are lined up. I do not even know how to make that happen. Um, which is really exciting. And also helps because I know then where the placement of the, it's gonna be easy to put the placement of the waist yarn for the the heel. So I'm getting close to having one and a half socks done on each pair and I've gotten in the habit of you know doing some knitting while I drink my morning tea and having things laying around the house in different places so that they're just there. You know you can get one or two rows done while you're waiting for a pot to boil as you're cooking dinner or whatever and so that has all been my summer knitting in terms of socks and I'm hoping to get that accomplished before school starts in August. Okay, but then I had cast on itis, so I cast on both of those. In addition, I have two sweaters that I am just desperate to get done. But first I had to finish the husband's one. So about the same time I got the yarn for the husband's sweater, I bought the yarn for the Towns Pullover, which is by um, Michelle Wang. Um, it's a Brooklyn Tweed pattern, and it's sort of a gradient style sweater. So this is a horrible picture. You can look it up in the link. But the shades come down, and then there's this little pixelated part that takes one color into the next. And I just loved it. And the Brooklyn Tweed Trunk Show came to my local yarn shop, and I went to see the actual sweater, and I loved it even more, and I couldn't wait, and I couldn't wait, and I just wanted to cast on. I didn't feel like it was mindless enough that I could use it as a baseball sweater. Um, so I cast on the leaf, uh, lace leaf pocket cardigan. Not to mention that yarn had been sitting around a little bit longer, so I felt guilty casting on this before I finished that. But once school is out, I couldn't resist. And I now have two sleeves done for this cardigan. So it starts off at the bottom and knit up um, the sleeves as well as the cardigan is the bottom up. And oh, goodness. fluff and hair. And this hasn't been blocked or anything. Um, still got all my little markers on it. But it starts off with a gray and then a lighter greeny gray and then this yellowy green and then this slightly darker yellowy green and then this sort of black green. Now, so here is my dilemma. I, I did this sleeve first of all so that I got the sleeves out of the way while the enthusiasm was there, you know? Because sleeves, oh, sleeves. I don't know what it is about sleeves. Um, second, it also helps me determine the gauge and practice the pattern. And um, hopefully all of the color work, excuse me, will, um, once it's blocked, I'm sure all the puckering from the color work will um, ease itself out. But when I did it, so, the these two colors when I picked out colors um, I did the black and white photo thing 
and when you hold the two balls, these two balls next to each other, they seem to be very different. They don't seem to be, and on this screen, they're showing up to be about the same. But in real life, this one is much more green and this one is much darker, has more black to it. And um, so I thought they'd be all right, even though it was obvious that the contrast was not going to be the same as the contrast, say, between these two or these two or these two, right? But um, once I got it knit up, I started to question the decision because after all, this contrast really is pretty low. So I did head back to my local yarn shop and looked at the other options to decide if perhaps I could switch this one out for something lighter or um, I really didn't want to change this one because I love this color. It's um, dark and woodsy and it just it speaks to me on many levels and I also didn't want to change this color or this color or I mean I loved them all and in the end there wasn't another green in this colorway that uh, in in the sorry this is um, Brooklyn Tweed Loft and um, And they just didn't have another green that didn't veer off into the blue arena. And they had some browns, but then you'd have all this like leading up to green and a brown and a green. And I really didn't want to change out this color. And, you know, I would have had to go with a dark brown or something. Um, so in the end, I decided it's okay. You know, it, it, it is what it is. I still love it. Um, it makes me very happy, even if this becomes more subtle. Now, having said that, um, it did improve once you have both of the, once you had all of this color done, then it was easier to notice that there's this shading here. And I suspect once you get the whole sweater together, then this becomes a little bit more of a marked difference. So I'm hoping that will help. And if it doesn't, if it's still fairly um, fairly subtle then that's okay because there still is all of this anyway I have the two sleeves done so that was exciting 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 and there are these little pops and flecks of yellow that I didn't want to miss out on I just I just love the way these colors are going together um, I think this is called snowbound maybe this is Artifact, Bird Book, Tent. I don't remember, but it's on my Ravelry page. Um, I know this is Artifact and Bird Book and Tent. These two I can't remember. So the next step was then to um, cast on for bird book artifact. Um, the main body of the sweater. And that's when I discovered I don't have circular needles the right length for moving forward. So I had purchased some uh, knitter, Knit Pro Zings um, for finishing in a size 3 for um, my husband's cardigan, which is right over there. <laughs> over there. Um, and that's what I started the cast on with. And it's what it, I, it's what I'm getting gauge with here, but now it's time to go up to a 4, and so this this will work for now. It's um, a little bit small, but I did take advantage of the fact that A, I love the Zing needles, um, and they're very inexpensive compared to a lot of needles out there, and so I ordered the other sizes that I need to finish the, the body, because these I did on double points. Um, but now I need the longer cable. So, this is the progress I've made on the Towns pullover.
and I'm very excited to get this done. I want to get this done before winter um, because I've been waiting for a long time to make some progress on that. So those are my works in progress um, and that leads us to what comes next. There are a bunch of things that I want to do. I could cast on three or four more pairs of socks. I could, um, I need to finish two sweaters and then I have another sweater that I bought yarn, yarn for with my Christmas gift certificate. So the last sweater I want to show you or talk about, um, I don't think I brought a picture. Well, uh, you can look it up online, um, but I'm sure you've heard of it. It's the Silver Forest um, Pullover, and it's by, oh look, the color is Snowbound. That's this gray at the bottom. Um, the Silver Forest Sweater by Jennifer Steinglass, um, who I believe is Knit Love Wool on Instagram. Anyway, she had a pattern sale um, earlier in the year where you could buy two and get a third free and every single one of her patterns they're beautiful beautiful color work patterns and so Silver Forest is one a more, a more recent one and I decided to knit that one in loft as well and the main body of the sweater is going to be this lovely kind of mustardy yellow and then there's going to be gray pale purple and dark purple color work at the yoke that I can't wait to cast on but I need to get this one done first <laughs> and my Rowan sweater I need to get those done first so I've been very good I have these sitting on my uh, computer uh, my desk just sitting there um, as little Hey, you got some time. You should be knitting so that you can get to me. The colors, this is um, Bale. This is Snowbound. So um, I like that there, if there's any leftover from that, this, or probably, um, probably won't need a full skein of this. So I could probably steal some of this if I ran out for the sweater, which I hope I won't do. This is called Blanket Fort, which is kind of a lavender-y color. And then this deep, dark, purple is called plume and it is a very deep dark purple so uh, that's what I've been up to um, trying to think if there's anything else don't think so I think that's everything I've been I've been working on now, one of the things that I have talked about in past episodes have been some of the vintage things that I got left um, through my grandmother. So my grandmother's still living, but she is going to be 97 next week. She'll be 97 and um, no longer able to do any of her handwork. She's in a, a, a nursing home at this point. And so when we cleared out her home, um, I inherited lots of her unfinished projects. <laughs> I didn't inherit all of them. I tried to be reasonable about the things I kept, the supplies I kept. Um, so I and and then my other grandmother was a knitter. This grandmother was mostly sewing and craft, um, but not knitting. And the other grandmother um, was a knitter, and I inherited some of her knitting stuff. And I've talked about that in the past. But one of the things I thought I might get around to this summer, but I haven't, uh, was a set of pillowcases that um, was in her stuff. So I thought I'd share those with you today, just because it's amazing to me um, the quality of material and fabrics that um, people could get in, in the 50s, 60s, maybe even the 70s. I don't know how old this is. But if you go to most of the craft stores, uh, even Walmart, if you ever go to the Sprawl Mart, um, in their craft section, there will be these pillowcases that either have a pre-stamped pattern on or you can purchase the patterns to stamp on stuff. 
that then the ink it, um, goes on temporarily and then you do the embroidery and then the ink is supposed to wash away. It was a big thing. I know my mother did these when I was young and my grandmother, but there's this set of pillowcases in her stuff that already have this fancy pink border on. And compared to the ones you get in today, in those kits today, um, or this may have been pre-purchased, this is a very heavy, heavy, sturdy pillowcase. The ones you get today, the, the material is kind of thin and weak. And you feel a little bit like if you're going to all that effort to do this embroidery, you really want it to hold up. Um, but this obviously was part of one of those patterns where you got the transfer that you then ironed on to the pillowcase and then that was the basis of knitting up this pillowcase. And I suspect that my grandmother probably did this in order to embroider a set of pillowcases for my mother when she got married which would have been in the 60s, and then never got around to it, one of those things. So, I have a pair of them. Second one is identical to the first one. There's no telling if I ever go to wash these, if that ink is now gonna come out. So I'm gonna have to make sure I'm very careful um, to cover up the ink as much as possible. And I have no idea what the original color scheme was. Um, so I have to think that through. I have plenty of embroidery floss from various projects. Um, back in the 80s, we were all into cross stitch. So I have a lot of embroidery floss left from that. Um, so I'm gonna have to think. Both of them have this pink um, scallop which I kind of think she may have done herself. I think she probably did that with herself. It does not look, there are a couple of little spots that made me think this was hand done, but I could be wrong. Uh, the pillowcases have some slight yellowing because they've been folded up for goodness knows how long. Um, but I'm probably going to have to come up with a purple and pink and green kind of theme. They look like lilies, like lily pads, which I have a little pond outside you've seen in past um, episodes. Um, and so it's tempting to make them bright yellow like my, my lily lilies out there. But that doesn't go so well probably with a pink. Who knows what I'll do. I thought this would be a good take a long kind of project haven't gone anywhere <laughs> haven't had time to do it so that is my vintage piece for today um, and I've talked about in past episodes languishing projects you'll be interested to note that my Christmas quilt that was languishing at this time last year still languishing and I'm not going to feel guilty about it because I think these have been languishing since late 50s, early 60s. So at least my languishing project is younger than that. Um, but at some point, perhaps in my newly quiet boys are all gone household, I will have time to get back to this um, kind of stuff. So, vintage project, uh, if you have any suggestions for that, um, let me know. Color schemes, ideas. Anyway, so that's about it for me today. Um, I'm going to end with some video of parts of my little office uh, sewing knitting room because I saw um, several places on Instagram. Um, I think I was using the um, explore option. 
So I, it's not, I'm not even sure it's anybody that I follow or anybody that I really remember whose um, posts they were. But people were asking how long you store your needles. And um, several of them did the mason jar thing. So I thought I'd put a clip in of the mason jars I use to store some of my knitting needles. Um, I have a set, a row of mason jars sitting on my um, worktop that um, have my last name on it. It was uh, my last name. My in-laws gave these mason jars to me um, because they had been given them a long time ago. They're old. I don't think the company makes the mason jars anymore. I, I need to look into it. I don't know. It's not one of the prominent um, mason jar companies. Um, but I love them because they have my name on them. And then another thing that I will show, put a little video clip in, is the way I store my circular needles. And that idea, I think I found, so when I was clearing out my grandmother's, um, the one who's crafty, the one who's about to be 97, she had saved four years wooden spools because she saved everything because you might need them someday. And I couldn't throw out the wooden spools because we don't get thread on wooden spools anymore. So I have this collection of wooden spools and I think I, I looked on Pinterest, you know, ideas for wooden spools and there are all these crazy things. But I saw somewhere um, somebody made a needle, a circular needle holder with these wooden spools. So I'll show you my version. I have the wooden spools and the number of the size of the um, needle in American sizes because I'm in America. So it's not the millimeter, it's the whole number sizes. And that hangs up on the side of a very large cabinet. Maybe someday when my office is a little tidier, I'll show you what it looks like. Um, but we have, I have a large um, step back cabinet in there and on the side of it hanging is this needle holder. And it works well for me to organize the needles that I have um, so that when I need a certain size circular needle, I just go pick the right one out. Um, so you can look at it and see what you think of that. Um, but those are two ways that I store my needles. And I have shown in a past episode, um, my great, my grandmother's, um, my knitting grandmother's um, needle roll. I have a couple of um, needle rolls from her that have a thousand metal um, straight needles in them. So, two weeks until the wedding, and then probably three weeks until I'm back in the thick of school. So the week after the wedding will be my son, my middle son's last week at his internship in South Carolina, and we are going to celebrate the end of that with a camping trip of some sort. Um, and then it will be, he will be home for a short bit. So it'll be back to school shopping and getting all everybody ready for going back to school. Um, his girlfriend will be down um, as well. And then they'll head back to Clemson for their senior year. Oh my goodness. And then I will go back to work and a week later, my baby will go to school as a senior in high school. So I'll have two seniors this year. Not sure how that's gonna work out in May. We've already discovered that my younger son is not gonna be able to be at the older son's graduation because it's in the middle of his IB exams. That's gonna be interesting. But anyway, that's where I'm at. So hopefully I will see you again in August. Um, it, thank you for coming back. I know it's hard when it's very sporadic, but I appreciate anybody who watches and um, hopefully I will see you before too long. Bye.